Oh, well, hello everybody. How are uh, you doing? We are going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff in the next uh, 35 minutes. Uh, not TypeScript this time. So the goal of this talk is kind of to remind you to pay attention to everything that's available to you. So, you know, when everything, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and it's pretty easy to solve the problems in the same way that you've always done it, but there's a lot of new stuff always coming out in Rails. So we're gonna talk about all kinds of different features that you, some you'll know, some you might not, um, and we'll touch on a lot of the new stuff in Rails 7 as well. All right, so we're gonna start off with a simple example that kind of demonstrates this. When you wanna send notifications to users, like if you're in a GitHub issue or pull request, you need to send um, email notifications out to all the users in the thread when a new comment shows up. Uh, but we of course need to skip the people who opted out of notifications and we don't wanna send it to the user who created that comment. So we need to drop down into SQL and say, give me all the users where their ID is not in this list of users who have opted out or the people we wanna skip. And this is fine, but we have to now drop into SQL level and uh, thinking about the problem, we kind of write the requirements and say like, we wanna skip these users. So Active Record has a new excluding method added in Rails 7 and uh, you can use that to instead say, give me all the users excluding these users. So instead of thinking about the problem on a SQL level, you're now thinking about it more like the requirements were written. So you can really like grasp this at a much quicker glance and figure out what uh, this is doing. So we don't even need to think about SQL hardly at all there. Um, another thing that we can do is try to remove dependencies. So uh, if you've ever used like the bullet gem to kind of detect N plus one queries and things like that, um, it's another dependency you have to maintain, you have to update it, you gotta make sure that it's compatible with Rails 7.1 as you're upgrading and all of that stuff. Uh, but Active Record added strict loading, so we can use that instead of having a separate gem. You can actually add this either as a scope on your queries or you can do it on associations. And if we do that and we load the first project and we don't say anything about we want to load the comments, when we attempt to load the comments, it will raise an error telling us there's an active record strict loading violation error. And that project is marked as strict loading. Comment association named comments cannot be easy, lazily loaded. So it's catching that N plus one query that um, we didn't explicitly say. So to do this correctly, what we wanna say is when strict loading is enabled, say project includes comments, and then grab the first project. So we just added the includes, and that's going to then load the project from the database, but also load the comments immediately for that. So then it gives us just the project back, but the comments are loaded in memory and ready to use whenever we need to. So then we can just ask for project.comments, and it gives us that back without raising that issue. So we're able to very uh, specifically decide when or when we don't want to use uh, that feature. Another cool feature of Rails uh, is generated column support. This isn't added to SQLite just yet, and there's still rough edges on Postgres, but it's had support in MySQL, and uh, Postgres was added in Rails 7, but you can use this to take a column, like in this case, uh, I'm using separate first and last name columns in the database, but we wanna be able to query on the full name, like if we're searching for a user when we're typing in an autocomplete, we might wanna say first name and a couple letters to their last name. So we can combine this at the database level and uh, store that in the database as well. So anytime we insert or update the record, it will automatically recalculate or compute the full name again using the first name column, adding a space, and then the last name together, and it will store it in the database. If you do not, or if you do store it as false, it will be calculated when you query the database instead of when you insert or update. So this can be useful for other things like maybe you wanna store amount in cents in the database, but sometimes you wanna uh, query in dollars and pennies. Um, <clears throat> you could use this for storing degrees in Celsius and also having a Fahrenheit column as well, something like that. 
At a read only is another cool thing. If you have some attribute that you definitely don't want any user to ever be able to change, you can use that to mark that as read only. Um, so here with the super admin flag, uh, somebody who can access the admin area, we don't want anybody else to be able to give themselves access to that. So you could use at a read only. This will be handled anytime you do an update, it will ignore those changes. And even if you try and get around it using update column, it'll skip it as well. So that um, takes care of that pretty nicely. Uh, with options is a feature in active support that's pretty neat uh, to reduce sort of the redundancy of adding a whole bunch of the same um, parameters. We can say with options, dependent destroy, and everything inside of that block when we call these methods will get dependent destroy automatically added to it, which is pretty handy. This isn't just an active record feature. Uh, so you can use this on in other situations. So for example, with uh, internationalization, we can say with options, set our locale and our scope. And then anytime we call i18n.t for our subject and our body when we're translating those, it will automatically include the locale and the scope in there as well. So it can be a way to kind of simplify your method calls for those redundant things. Try uh, used to come up in conversations a lot more, but then Ruby added the safe navigation operator, the ampersand period, um, which works for a lot of things. But if you want to do something like this, where you want to call a method, if the object responds to that method, then it doesn't really help in that case. You still need to check and see if it responds to it, um, because the safe navigation operator is mostly helpful around nils and calling methods on a nil object. This becomes a little bit of a mess when you start to have fallback things, like we want to call this default method, and it starts to get a lot messier. So instead, you can say try the method name, and it will do the same as we have above, which really reads nicely. And you can say try method name or fall back to whatever default. So it's a nice way to clean up um, any of that conditional logic there. Uh, another super useful feature of Rails that not enough people talk about is action text embeds. Action text at the surface looks like a rich text editor where we can format text, but you can actually embed any active record model in your um, text editor here. So if you're on you know, GitHub and they have like, you type a commit in your comment, that commit gets linked to the uh, commit page and everything. You can kind of do the same stuff here, but what's nice about this is rather than just linking the text, um, it actually embeds the database record into the text there. So anytime I would change my avatar or my name, next time this renders, it would use the latest for that, which is pretty cool. So the way all this works is when you start typing a user and you have some autocomplete, it goes and asks the server for some JSON. So the two things we need to send back are an attachable SGID or signed global ID and then some HTML content for that preview of, of what we want to embed. So if we break these down, an attachable sign global ID looks like this. It's a token. Uh, there's a double hyphen there. So the left side is some encoded data in Base64, and the right side is the signature. And this is what um, we use when we embed that in the editor. So when we are rendering or saving this to the database, uh, well, actually, when we are inserting it back into the editor, we need to take the JavaScript, grab the JSON, insert the content in the SGID that we got from the server, and insert that as an attachment into the tricks editor, which is the front end for action text. <clears throat> so on the back end, when we save that, we actually don't save any of the HTML for my avatar or my name or anything. We just have this action text attachment with an SGID. And that is what tells Rails how to find the record and then how to render it again so that we can display it in our HTML. So the sign global IDs are pretty uh, simple. They look like something that you can't decipher, but they're just base 64 encoded JSON. So here we can decode that. You'll see we get a JSON message that uh, has an expiration and a purpose so the purpose helps uh, make sure that this isn't used for some other malicious use case where they grab this and are able to like uh, assign something to a different record or something. So the purpose and the expiration help 
with security there. And you'll notice that the Rails message here is also Base64 encoded. We can decode that, and we'll see that this is for the Jumpstart Pro app user model, and we have record number one that we need to reference there. So they're all a lot simpler than you might expect. <clears throat> so once all that is rendered, Rails will go through the HTML, it'll find the attachments, look up the user, render that partial for it, and then you get the final result, which is just HTML that looks fancy. Um, so this is like a really cool feature of Rails that uh, I don't think enough people take advantage of, because you can use this to reference literally any model in your app. So you can have you know, the at symbol to mention a user, you might do a hashtag to mention a project or anything else that you would like. And behind the scenes, one cool thing about this that I learned from reading the source code in Action Text was you can use serialize on other things other than just a Ruby hash. So a lot of times you see serialize used and it is basically taking a Ruby hash and converting it to JSON or YAML and saving it in the database. In this case, it is taking the HTML and then loading that not into a Ruby hash, but into an action text content object. And you can use this to basically take an attribute in your database, serialize it into any Ruby class that you would like. To do that, all you have to do is add these self.load and self.dump methods on your class. So you can define your own. And as long as you implement these two, load is going to take the HTML out of the database. And here it handles nils. So if there is nothing there, we don't instantiate a new action text content. And same for dump, we take the action text contents content, um, or the object itself, and then we convert it to HTML and then save it in the database. But if it was empty, we, uh, nil, then we just return nil and don't save anything in the table. So you can use this to build your own objects immediately through Active Record without having to like define your own method that wraps a thing and instantiates it, and um, you can let Active Record take care of that for you with serializing. Another really cool feature is Action Mailbox inbound emails. Colin works with me at GoRails. He wasn't able to make it, but he gets a slide, so he sort of made it. Um, but when you're on GitHub, you might see that a lot of comments, like Colin wrote, were either written on the GitHub app or on the website directly, but I replied to that via email. And anytime you're implementing comments, it's really convenient because you're gonna send notifications out probably through email. It's very convenient to be able to have people hit reply in their uh, email client and then take that and insert it into uh, a record in the database as if they were on the website. So the way all this works is you define in an action mailbox your routing. So you use a regex to figure out whoever sent this email, does it match, um, does their email address match one of these regexes? So for example, we could use at replies.example.com. In the regex, we want to just say at replies dot so that in t uh, test, development, staging, production, we could use different domains and this code would apply exactly the same across those. So this will route any emails that come from something at replies.example.com to the replies mailbox. And the replies mailbox has a process action that handles what to do with the email. So if we're replying to something, we need to look up the conversation and create a new post for it. We can have methods to take the user who that email they sent from um, and, and decide, basically, do we look them up in the database and find them? Do they not exist? Do we create another user or something? But we can set them, find them as an author, set that there, take the body of the email, do the same thing, and we can even save the email message ID so that when we send out future notifications to that thread, our email client can have them all in the same email thread. So there's a couple headers you can use in your emails like in reply to and references. So if we write a comment and there is a message ID, then we could have the email header of in reply to say, we're replying to that email, and then your client will figure out to put them all together. And we can look at the email that it was sent from and stuff and use that in the recipients or the senders or whatever to you know, parse the emails and figure out what we want to do that with that email. 
Another thing that uh, <clears throat> I don't think gets used enough is routing constraints. So uh, if you're building applications like uh, where you want to have p the f potential of taking you know, your, your homepage and your marketing site and separating that out into a separate application, in the meantime, you could do something simple like this where if we're on app.example.com, we can render the dashboard as the root but if we were on www or no uh, subdomain, we could render out the marketing homepage instead. So you can kind of use this to, if you know that maybe in the future we'll use, I don't know, WordPress or something for the marketing site, but the Rails app will live under app, then you can use this temporarily or whatever in between. But there's all kinds of things you can do with this. Uh, so you could use that for marketplaces, um, kind of like having your shopify.com subdomain. Um, but you can also use this, and this is an example from Devise, uh, where you can use this to look at the request, grab the session information, and say, is there a user logged in? Yes. Are they an admin? Because we get the user object back. Uh, underscore one, if you're not familiar, is a numbered parameter, so your lambda doesn't have to take an argument. It's kind of inferred, and then we can reference that with underscore one without having to say the, the authenticated user takes a user argument, user.admin, we can shorten all that to this. And so the resources admin routes will only be uh, written for users who are logged in and an admin. So this would 404, uh, if anybody tried to go to slash admin and they were authenticated or not, but if they were not an admin, they would never see that and would get a 404. So we can also just say in general, if you're logged in, we'll show the dashboard as the root instead of the marketing site, which we might have um, otherwise if you're not logged in. And fun fact, 11 years ago, uh, the little, the Lambda portion of the authenticated scope was something that I contributed to devise and one, was one of my very first open source uh, contributions. So it's kind of cool to look back on that and see uh, uh, it's crazy that it was 11 years ago already. So, uh, Another routing feature that's super handy is the ability to draw routes and other files. So you can write your routes file, and normally you just stuff a ton of routes in here, and as it gets more and more complex, file just gets longer and longer. But with draw, you can use this to have certain routes written into different file to kind of organize that a little bit better. So if we were to do that with API, we can make it config routes.api or routesapi.rb, put all of our API routes in there and organize them separately from the main application routes. So you could use this to put your admin routes in a different area. Uh, if you're building like a marketplace, you could put your front end, storefront routes in one file and your back end routes in another file and just kind of organize it like that to be a little bit easier when you're going to look for um, routes and stuff or work on that. You can also use Rails to create your own custom generators. So this is a thing that I did not too long ago in um, our Jumpstart Pro template where we, instead of integrating and grabbing like 100 different API clients that all depend on different HTTP libraries, like some might use Faraday, some might use HTTP RB, some might use HTTP party, uh, instead of doing all that, I made a generator for API clients that will use net HTTP and gives you a bunch of helpers out of the box. So you can just say, I want to integrate with OpenAI. Here's their base uh, URL for their, um, their API. And then inside of there, we can define methods. Say, make a GET request to uh, you know, an endpoint and include our authentication and all of that stuff. So you can use this, uh, you can use API the API client uh, to do any of those, but you can use Rails to generate generators to do this kind of stuff. So the way that works is you say <laughs> bin Rails generate generator, which will generate a generator for the API client that goes in lib generators and then creates another generator file in there. So um, this will generate, if you've ever looked at the Rails generators for scaffolds or models or migrations, it's basically the same layout. So you get a generator file that determines what arguments it takes, what uh, options you can give it, how you can configure things. 
then you can use that to generate the files. So for example, if you're generating a model, it would create a migration and the model file. You'd put those under templates, and you would use those templates, which are Ruby files that are, have ERB that can be evaluated in them. So you can make Rails generate model user, and it would have a base template for the model, and then it would insert user into the Ruby code. So it's kind of nested Ruby that way. Then another feature that uh, you can take advantage of are custom TurboStream actions. So for example, if you wanted to say, let's use the browser notification API and have a CSV import that uh, is maybe going to take forever, or we want to periodically update the user and tell them, like, we've imported 1,000 users, it's now 2,000, whatever. It might be handy to use something like the browser notification API. And you can use this pretty easily with um, custom turbo streams. So turbo stream looks like this. You've got a turbo stream HTML tag, an action attribute. The name for that is notification in our case. We made that up. That's the feature we want to add. And then you can give it other attributes. So uh, title is required for a notification in the browser. You can also put a template inside of this if you would like. Um, that might be useful for other things, but our notifications are just going to be simple. So you can generate these HTML tags in Rails using the TurboStream action tag helper. You can also set up this to, uh, which this would be easiest to render in a template, like in a response on a request. But you can also uh, generate these you know, in a background job using the TurboStream tag generators. And on the client side, once the HTML is inserted on the page, the JavaScript will connect. It will, the TurboStream tag is a custom element, and it will call the function with the matching name as the action. So in our case here, we define the notification function. We say, let's ask the browser for permission to send a notification. It will ask you yes or no, do you want to accept or allow or block? And if you allow it, it's going to return the status of granted, which we can then create a new notification, take the title attribute from that HTML tag, and then use that as the title argument for the notification. And everything will work. And you will get a beautiful little browser notification on your desktop. Um, so this is pretty cool. There are also a ridiculous amount of active support features that um, I didn't even know uh, tr uh, truncate words until recently. I've always used just truncate. But if you have text, say you're building an index page for a blog, and you want to show a preview of the blog posts, I would typically go and use truncate and say, give me the first 500 characters or something. And that would work pretty well. But it would often just cut off a word in the middle uh, at, right at 500 characters. So instead, we can use truncate words. Take the content, truncate it to, in this case, five words to keep it short. We can customize how the omission looks. By default, it's just three periods, but we could add other stuff to that. You can even probably add a read more link or something if you wanted. But the way that uh, this will work is to chop the words and give you the first five back and add that omission content afterwards. There's a ridiculous amount of other helpful things and active support for strings, pluralizing, and all that. Um, but you can go through those docs and discover methods that uh, you probably have not even noticed existed before. Uh, there's a ton of other time helpers as well. So we've all written code that looks like this, where we've got something like a start time. We need to compare it to another time. In this case, we'll just say time.current. We have to read this and say, starts at less than the current time, which probably means that it's before the current time. And it can get tricky to read that uh, at a glance. So there's a helper for that. You can say starts at is before time.current. Or you can take it a step further if you're using the current time. And you can ask if the time is in the past. So it's way easier to read these things when you're just glancing through the code and reading the logic. Same thing goes the other direction, starts at greater than current time, which means that it's in the future. So we've got starts at after another time. And if we want to use uh, the helper for that, we can also use um, 
Future. So it's much easier to read these at a glance and think at a higher level um, when you're trying to like edit some code that you wrote six years ago or something, and it's been a while since, since you've seen it. Some of the other time helpers are pretty cool. You can say all day on any date, so it doesn't have to be the current day. But if you do that on uh, today, it will give us the beginning of the day and the end of the day as times and create the range for you automatically. I've done this where I've um, created the range myself every single time because I didn't realize there was an all day helper where I would go do parentheses, time.current.beginning of day, which will give us the first and then dot dot and then do end of day to get that. But instead, now I can just say all day and clean that up considerably. Same thing applies for uh, all week, so you can get that. All week is a little bit unique because you can configure the start day and the, um, the end of the week. So if the week starts on Monday in, where you live, then you can do that, or you can set it to start at Sunday as well, and it will give you Monday through Sunday or Sunday through Saturday. Uh, another one that I like is all month, uh, especially when I'm trying to display like a calendar and I've got a whole list of events or something that I want to display instead of creating the range and doing that from scratch all month, hit the database and we get everything in the month of October. Uh, and then we can pass that straight into Active Record, which can handle the ranges and make sure that the uh, start time or whatever we're recording on is between those two times. Uh, Matt Swanson had a really good post on Twitter, which I will walk you through. Uh, but basically, he was talking about building abbreviated numbers for social media. So if a post has 123 views, we're going to display 123. If it has 1,234, we're going to have the comma delimiter in there, so 1, 234. But once we get to 10,000, we want to start shortening that and uh, rounding it and then displaying a short character afterwards to represent thousands, millions, or billions. So we see the same thing for 2.3 million. So I typically would just jump in and be like, oh, this is a pretty simple problem. I have good uh, test cases and inputs and outputs, and it wouldn't be that hard to do the rounding and stuff myself. But if you want to be smart about this, you take advantage of the features that Rails gives you. So there's a helper called Number to Human, where if you give it a number, 123, gives you 123 back. But if you get into the thousands, it will give you 12.3 thousand. So it's kind of close, but still not exactly what we want. If we look at this a little bit further with uh, 1.234 million, we get 1.23 million. We kind of want to control the uh, rounding so that we only see one number after the decimal. And it's close. And we can control the rounding with precision, but this one, unfortunately, rounds a little bit too high. So it inflates the number at 489,000 to 490,000, which may or may not be a bad thing, but we probably want to round down just to keep things um, from being artificially inflated. Like as the number gets bigger, uh, it might jump hundreds of thousands in rounding. So we can do something, uh, well, here's another example where we can kind of, you know, adjust it, but it's not going to work the same across all these different numbers, where we can get the one number afterwards and round there. It's close, but it wouldn't work with the other numbers. So then uh, the last option that's there is we can specify significant as false, which will use the precision to actually control the numbers after the decimal place which would mean that we could say one is our precision to have a single number afterwards. So if we were to build our number to social helper, first thing we would do is say if the number is less than 10,000, we would use number with delimiter, which is the one that inserts commas so that it is a, a friendly human readable number with the commas. Then we would take advantage of number to human. We'd give it the number, which would be 10,000 or greater. We'd set the precision to one, so we only have one number after the decimal. We'd tell it round mode is down. This is one of those things where you can discover that that's not documented as an argument that you can use. But if you read the source code, you'll see that it uses the rounding thing underneath and passes those arguments to the rounding. So you can actually combine sort of 
reading the docs for both of these things and, and discover you can actually do this. So you can round down so we don't accidentally inflate the numbers any more than we want to. Significant is false, turns that precision to the period or after the decimal. And then we can change the format to remove the space in between the number and the unit, which is there by default. So we just remove that. And then we can tell it, uh, you know what? Don't write the whole word thousand million or billion, just use K, M or B as the unit. And that is it. So we now have written that whole thing, number to social with no custom logic. We didn't have to do any of that ourselves. We're just using two helpers that Rails already gives us. And voila, we have not number to social that works exactly how we want it to. Um, and we didn't do anything other than using the tools that were given to us. So it's very helpful and time-saving to know what Rails gives you and uh, take advantage of those. So in the last few minutes, let's go through a bunch of the new stuff in Rails 7.1. So there's tons of new stuff. Uh, Rails env local, super cool. There's tons of times in my configuration, like initializers, where I'll check and see if we're in development or test and set something up. But now we can say Rails env local instead, which uh, we'll check if it's development or test. Cool thing that you might not know is that is actually implemented using active support inquiry. So this is a method you can call in strings. It will return an object that uses method missing to uh, basically look at the method you call, strip the question mark, and then compare the method name with the string that you originally had. So if we call inquiry.production on production, those match, so it's true, but inactive on active is false because they do not match. And it's a super duper simple class in active support that makes this work that you should go read. Um, and is it just a handy thing that you might want to use in your applications as well? So if you're like on Hatchbox, we support all these different hosting providers. So we can use the inquiry to say dot AWS, dot DigitalOcean question mark, dot whatever. And uh, we can add those and use method calls instead of comparing strings in our code. And it looks a little nicer when we're uh, writing that code. Rails also ships with a new unused routes. So uh, you probably are in the same habit I do of using resources routes by default, but sometimes I don't actually go back and specify that I only needed certain routes, uh, but ra resources routes will give us the full crud. So you can use Rails routes to go find those mistakes and clean them up. Maybe you meant to implement the edit and update and destroy, so you realize, oh shoot, we should go do that. Or uh, you discover, yeah, we don't need those routes, so let's go edit the routes file and have the resources only generate the routes we need, and then we can make sure we don't have any extraneous things there. Uh, template strict locals is super handy. When you were rendering uh, locals, or rendering partials, you have to give it local variables, and now you can specify in a magic comment at the top of the template exactly what you need. So in this case, we need a message, especially for the DOM ID call. If that was nil, it would throw an error. Um, and so this says locals requires message, and then we call, uh, if we were to call this with render partial message missing that message local, we would get an argument, mer argument error missing local message. So the proper way to call that would be uh, take the partial, give it locals, and make sure we set the message. You can also give it default values. So we could call this one, and it would render hello if we didn't give it any. But if we did give it a message, it would render hey instead. So we can have default values and make those arguments optional as well. And of course, you can also give it none and make it strict so that it will raise an argument error if you pass locals to a template that doesn't uh, accept any. So this one, we would just call render partial message, and that would be the way we want to call it. Normalizes is super nice. I don't know how many times I've done this where I have an attribute. User types in, for example, their emails. Sometimes they use caps. Um, sometimes they have tabs or spaces at the ends. So we need to take the value when it's assigned, strip it, downcase it. Value could be nil, so we have to use the safe navigation operator the ampersand period to call these, just in case it's nil. And this works fine, but Rails already defines a setter method for assigning a new email address. 
So we got to override it and then pass the new value to super. And it gets annoying when we have lots of these. So in Rails 7.1, we have normalizes. And then you can say normalizes email with this lambda. It takes the email. Uh, this only will be applied when uh, email is present. So if it's nil, it skips this. So we don't need to deal with the safe navigation operators. And we call email strip down case. Um, this is a little redundant to read. You see normalizes the email with email, email strip down case. So we could replace that with a numbered parameter and just say normalizes email with strip down case. <clears throat> How secure password has some great improvements, but there are little uh, important things to know. So you add a how secure password to your user model. It needs to have a password digest column in the database. And uh, we can use that, or previously we could use it this way, where we'd find the user. And if they existed with the safe operator, we can call authenticate, pass in their password. The problem with this is that if the user does not exist, it will finish early. So we wouldn't instantiate a user. We wouldn't call authenticate. And somebody who's paying attention to our site and measuring the speed of our requests when we're authenticating would be able to tell that my user doesn't exist in the database because it, that request ran way faster than the one that had a matching user. And it did att attempt to authenticate. So instead of doing that, we now have user authenticate by. You give it the email and password. And what this will do is go look for Chris at GoRails.com in the database. If it exists, we log in or attempt to log in with our password. But if it does not exist, this will actually instantiate a new user in memory to mimic the same time that it would take if the user did exist. So that way, it's not really a measurable difference between the two if a user uh, existed or did not. So it helps with timing attacks um, and mitigating those. The other thing that we get now is the password challenge. So if you want to change your password, you can give it your password params, which are going to be a standard. Params require the user, and then we permit the password, password confirmation, but we want to be able to confirm their current password before they are allowed to change their password. This works great, but there is a gotcha. If you're not careful and you just did this, a user could go to the edit password page, just delete in their browser the password challenge field, and only submit the password confirmation and password, and it would skip that validation of their current password. So that alone is not enough. This is a cool feature of active support that you can call on um, hashes and things. With defaults is going to say, if there is no password challenge in that hash, let's make sure there is a default of an empty string. So we'll make sure there's always a value for that, which is going to then ensure that has secure password will validate the password challenge before making changes. So this is how you would want to implement that with the new password challenge. And another cool feature of active support that not enough people know about. I'm going to run through the last few things pretty quick. Generates token four allows you to generate uh, tokens, which you can set for expiration. So here's one for password reset, expires in 15 minutes. And then inside the block, you can pass in some data, which will be embedded into the token. And when it is used, uh, it will actually check to make sure this data that was embedded in the token is the current uh, data. And if that has changed, for example, if you successfully updated your password, your password salt is going to be different. So those uh, would be different. And then this would end up being a one-time use token that does not need to be saved in the database. We don't have to save the token. We don't have to save the expiration or any of that in the database. This can all be generated on the fly, emailed out, and sent. So the way that works, you generate a token for the password reset. It gives you that back. You'll notice that this is very similar to the uh, sign global IDs. It's base 64 encoded um, token. Then you can look them up with the same method name, uh, password reset. You give it the token, it will give you a user back or nil. And the last thing we're going to talk about is active storage variants. Um, when active storage came out, I was implementing you know, user avatars across all these different templates. And sometimes I'd catch myself where the avatar might be 150 pixels by 150. Sometimes it might be 100 by 100 or 200 by 100. 
um, you know, different sizes for the same purpose of displaying like a thumbnail of the user avatar. So now we can give them named attachments. Um, and that's been in Rails 7, but Rails 7.1 allows you to say pre-processed is true. So as soon as that's assigned and saved, it will go kick off a background job to process it, which is handy because the first request uh, in the, without this would go and do the transformation and resizing, which has a little bit of a delay. So you'll see like a broken image for a second. And once the job is finished and it's processed, then you would see it. But this should reduce that quite a bit. And then lastly, for active storage, if you were going to implement files that are generic, uh, you might have a PDF, which is not resizable, but you can preview it. So you would have to check if it's a file that's previewable, then we can generate the preview for the thumbnail of the PDF. If it's variable, like a PNG that we can resize, then we can call the variants on it, but you would end up in your views or helpers implementing this conditional all over the place. So Rails now has a representation method that does all this behind the scenes for you. So you can call one method in your views and it's way cleaner and you can get rid of that uh, logic there. So that is everything. I'm out of time. Um, goal here is always be learning. There's all kinds of new stuff coming out. One of the things that Raphael talked about that you know he keeps up to date by reading the commits in Rails main every single day, which I thought was super smart. It helps you keep up on these things, which I've started doing. But if you can't keep up with that, we are trying to you know, do that for you in video format on Go Rails. So trying just to keep everybody educated on all the new stuff, take advantage of those things, and make you more productive. Maybe not the 10x developer that you hope to be, but you can probably get there knowing a lot of these tools. So that is it. Thank you very much.